Hello again, everyone. Hi, everyone. Today we've got Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hello, everyone. Hi, Phil. Hi, Jod. Great okay. to have you on board. Uh, yeah. We've got uh, a bit of a break from our normal step-by-step -step series through the Psalms. As you've probably seen, we've looked at some of the themes that occur in the Psalms. Jod has been uh, showing up that star icon and this is one of our special series uh, special videos on one of the recurring uh, themes and we're going to look at the title shortly and kevin's going to take us through some of that but before we get into this uh as usual george's got his uh slide that shows where we're up to where are we up to at the moment george yeah so as phil was saying we're taking a little break from the journey that we're going on through the psalms um so we're still in book one obviously um on the journey uh we've we dealt with phil on that special series the one week on Selah, which was really helpful to think about as one of the big themes throughout the book of psalms and obviously we've come across titles um in some previous videos that we've had i think we saw in psalm 7 and psalm 3 um and as we said kev's gonna pick up some of those thoughts on titles tonight so kev my big question for you is what what do we mean by the, the, the Psalms title? Well, that's, uh, hopefully he knows the answer because that's what we asked him to consider. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, um, as if by magic, I have that as my first question on the slide too. Um, okay, so what do we mean by uh, the titles of the Psalms? And um, I, I guess this is a potentially a little bit of a confusion sort of topic there's there's things that we can get maybe get a little bit um confused by let me um i knew that was going to ding on me there we go let's uh put up a example from an english translation then it's from the esv it's psalm 51 so i'm just going to consider for the moment um psalm 51 and what is the psalm title in this psalm and what's not the psalm title um because as you can see as, as it's there on the screen the esv has right across the top of the psalm create in me a clean heart O god then it's numbered psalm 51 and then we've got this bit in a, an unusual sort of all capital response to the choir master a psalm of david when nathan the prophet went to him after he'd gone into bathsheba Verse one, have mercy on me, O God. And then we're seemingly into the psalm. Okay, so what's the title? What's the title of the psalm? What, when we say that phrase, title of the psalm, what do we mean by it? Well, there you go. It's the bit there in um, red. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about the title of the psalm. It's the bit of the text from the Hebrew original, I said I wasn't going to say the word original and I've said it, there we go. Uh, it's the bit from the text that we have of the Hebrew scriptures um, that is there and is translated for us. Okay, the bit in red. The bit in white, um, the bits in white are editorial editions by translators when they've translated from Hebrew into English. So if you notice, the bits in white there, um, it's the bit that we read right across the top. That's something English translators put in, create in me a clean heart, oh God, a sort of summary of what the whole of the psalm is about, they think. Um, even the psalm number and the verse numbers um, are editorial decisions by translators and not in the source text. So I guess even if you've got different Bible versions, or some of you might have an NIV or other Bible versions, sometimes that bit at the top in white could be different as well because they've got different editors, different translators. Um, Absolutely. Or it might not be there at all. Mm. Yeah. And, and that's actually true all the way through, not just in the Psalms, but through the other books of the scriptures mm. in the different translations into English, you'll often find paragraphs divided up and um, it might be in a different font. It might be italics, it might be bolded or whatever. And those, um, those paragraph headings 
are not part of either the Hebrew Old Testament or the Greek New Testament text being translated. They're the editorial edition to try and help us maybe sort of break it up and think about it in, in the paragraph sort of form and, and give us a summary of what's going on in that chapter. What about the numbers paragraph. then? What are the numbers? How do they fit in? Oh yeah, and the verse, the verse numbers and the, and the chapter numbers throughout our scriptures, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, they've all been added um, at a later point by some sort of editor translator. Um, and we'll look in a minute to see that those number that numbering is not necessarily consistent from language to language in translation. Different languages, modern languages, have got different conventions going on there. And you get that a bit from the way that um, the the people in scripture quote scripture that's previous to them. Sometimes you never get them saying this chapter and verse. Mm. It never happens, does it? In in the Bible. In fact, the only time I can think of it happening is um, the second psalm. Oh, yeah. is referenced in the New Testament. Now, so it's fairly easy potentially to count two Psalms in, but by the time you get sort of 50, mm. 60 in, you might be a bit more uncertain as to how many you are through if those numbers are not there. Um, With other big texts so, in uh, ancient texts, they tend to dry, divide up into sort of chapters and verses, don't they? I think like Homer is some of his work and some of the others, just so you can find the right place <laughs> that we're talking about. Exactly, it's, it's for convenience, yeah, yeah. So actually when people referred back to the Old Testament, sometimes they would say in the, pa- or in, you didn't even say this bit, but it meant in the passage of the burning bush. Mm. They might have said, or they might have said the passage of the angels, and it referred to a specific section rather than a chapter number. Yeah, so that, that's an interesting point. Right, so the bit I was going to say then about this, this bit in red that we're calling the title of the psalm, um, at least in part, it might be the work of a Jewish editor from way back when getting the, the text into the form that we consider to be now the, the form that is the scripture, um, and then that has gone on to be translated into English and other languages. Um, as the set text of, um, particularly in this case, Psalm, Psalm 51. So it might not have been, it says it's a Psalm of David, maybe David didn't put the um, description in himself, but by the time it becomes part of Jewish scripture, that has now become sort of set within the text. So it's the thing that's there in the original that gets translated on for us into our language. Because I guess a simple point around that is that David would have died before some of the whole the whole book of the Psalms, as George calls it, would have been put together because there's ones from other people that lived after him. So somebody at some point has got all these different Psalms and put them together in a compilation and maybe that person or someone at that time might have put some of these titles together maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the interesting thing then is that in English, and this might be why we some sometimes not quite sure with this bit in red, is it part of the psalm, part of the text or, or not? Um, and that's because our English verse convention is that we start verse numbering um, after we've got past the title. Mm. Mm. Okay, so interestingly, um, there on the screen on the right-hand side is a modern Hebrew text of Psalm 51. And the bits in red are the title on both translations, or, or the, the Hebrew and the, the English translation. And then the bit in yellow is what we'd normally consider the beginning, perhaps, of the psalm itself. Mm. But notice the way that it's numbered here for the Hebrew. It starts verse one from the beginning of what we're calling the title. And so our verse one of the psalm is actually the Hebrew verse three of the psalm by the hebrew modern convention of of numbering That's all right so they should have a little bit confused perhaps if we're talking <laughs> languages as to yeah. what is psalm 51 verse one read verse two is for us in hebrew jordan you might get a bit confused <laughs> <laughs> yeah is psalm 51 verse one to the choir master a psalm of david or is it um have mercy on me O god depending on which language we're in wow. no it gets even worse than that actually <laughs> <laughs> right there's there's the ancient or the ancient um jewish translate uh, jewish greek translation of uh the hebrew so one of the first translations um 
their numbering system. You can see the numbering of the verses is just like it was in the Hebrew. So mm. verse three in the Greek is at the same point as it was in Hebrew, but it's our English verse one. But that little N dash thing actually signifies in the way that Greeks wrote numbers, headings, the number 50. <laughs> oh, not so 51. Our, yeah, our Psalm 51 is a Greek Psalm 50. A missing one then. Ah, oh, are they? Yeah, that's the thing. So Psalm 9 and 10, as we have them in Hebrew and, in, and translated into English, two separate Psalms. But in the Greek translation, done way back when, Psalm 9 and Psalm 10 are merged together mm. to be one psalm. And the potential basis for that is the way that the poetry works and seems to continue on through from 9 into 10. And actually, there's none of the sort of red bit between Psalms 9 and 10. So there's nothing as a sort of title thing that talks about to the choir master or who is the psalm by that, that's there to split definitively 9 and 10 from one another. So well, it's good you bring that up now because potentially we're going to look at that next week, uh, God willing, Joel, aren't we? Okay. Um, nine. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah, definitely. So almost, Kev, with what we've looked at with the Hebrew and the, the Greek text is that it possibly may not, even though in the English we would class that as a title, it's more part of the psalm and it should be read in context of that psalm. Certainly read in context of the psalm. Yeah. To say it's part of the psalm, it, it's sort of, sort of yes and no, because it's... it's it's part of the original, it's part of the text that's come yeah. to us there um, in the form that it's intended to come to us um, from Hebrew, but it's, and it's referring to the psalm that follows, yeah. uh, but is it part of the psalm itself? Not, not really, is it? It's, it's, a, it's an introduction to yeah. the words of the psalm, and it's some, but it's something that's useful and important to us in potentially thinking about the psalm to which it refers mm -hmm. so, so the difference is the bit in white is a title that um our translator is put in because the translator thought that's what he'd like to, to put as a summary of it and we could have made that up ourselves and put yeah. something different or something similar each of us um but the bit in red has come from way back when um and has been incorporated into what we consider to be the scriptures Mm. that makes sense yep. yeah that's helpful so you're talking kev about psalm 9 and 10 with some uh, acrostic patterns going on um mm -hmm. i'm sure psalm 119 is quite similar in that regard of being acrostic as well isn't it yeah it is uh there you go i think that's the point we're just talking about mm -hmm. and if by magic again there is psalm 119 or at least the first eight verses of that mega psalm is it 176 verses or something I think you're right, yeah yeah so the only other place um in the psalms at least where we've got something in our english bibles often written um ab above or between the verses within a psalm um i know you've looked at cedar before and that is part of the hebrew text but mm. we also have these um strange sounding names to divide up sections of eight verses in Psalm 119. And those are translator editorial decisions to put these little subheadings in for Psalm 119. And what they're doing there is they're, they're giving us the Hebrew letters of, their, of the Hebrew alphabet. Either it's the letter itself, the sort of squiggle here that looks like a bit like an X, uh, mm -hmm. or it's, it's an Aleph, um, is, is how it's called for the first letter of the Hebrew um, alphabet. So, so the reason they've done that is because the way that Psalm 119 works is a highly ordered psalm, and each set of eight verses starts with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So let me just sort of highlight that for you. You can see popping up mm. on the right-hand side, and you have to remember that Hebrew reads from right to left, not left to right. So the first letter of each verse, each line of the um, psalm, is an aleph. The word begins with an aleph. So it's highly ordered, and potentially that's there to make it very memorable, or easier to, to memorize. It's going to be tricky to memorize 176 verses, but easier. So, so 
eight times the the um, the, ver the, 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 the verse the sentence starts with an aleph, and then in the next section it will be a bet that starts each of nine to fifteen. It will be, won't it, in the verse numbers and so on through the twenty-two letters of the, the Hebrew alphabet. Um, so so that's that's why in English it, it, they've just put that there and it's maybe if you don't if you're not in the know as to why they've done that that's why they've done it to just let remind us that each of the letters originally in the hebrew starts each of the sentences starts with the same letter of the hebrew alphabet yeah otherwise would really be none the wiser it doesn't the english yeah. text doesn't really show that at all yeah okay interesting helpful okay so let's just think then about a, a generalized sort of psalm structure as it stands um, in our English translations in different Bible editions. Okay, so uh, we were looking at Psalm 51 and most of the things that are, I've listed there, these four things come at Psalm 51 before the Psalm proper starts. Um, so you have a, a liturgical application, um, how it's to be used in divine worship so we'll come on to that in a minute what i mean by that um we then have secondly have maybe a description of the piece um we then might have um authorship given um and we might have something about the circumstances which created inspired the psalm to be written in in the first place those are the four main things that you'll get within um the title of a psalm before we come to the psalm itself proper. Mm -hmm. And remember, these things are all things that are there in the um, Hebrew text. Um, and we've already covered a few of those, haven't we, Phil, with the circumstances in Psalm 3, and we've seen to the chief musician, another one that's mm -hmm. about perhaps description of a piece or the application. So, yeah, that's helpful to point it out in those bullet points, Kev. Mm. Yeah, so I, I think it's the case that um we didn't have all four of them in psalm 51 we had three of the four so there's an example um on the screen psalm 54 um where we have actually got all four of the elements and that's unusual but like most of the psalms have not got the four elements all together mm. um there's 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 many or several psalms without any of the um elements at all no title okay I think you've already looked at Psalm 1, mm -hmm. Psalm 2. Neither of those have got anything preceding the psalm itself. And then I think your first one was Psalm 3. Mm. Um, so Psalm 3, it's a psalm of David, right? So it's got the authorship. Mm -hmm. uh, and it says, when he fled from Absalom, his son. So it's got the circumstances of composition, but it hasn't got a description of the piece and it hasn't got anything about applying it in worship. Or, um, sort of terms mm -hmm. so here's one's got all four to the choir master with stringed instruments is the translation that they've gone with for the first bit of the title so that's your liturgical application and you and use in divine worship it's something that's been dedicated or handed over to the choir master and maybe there's something about the way it's to be played and accompanied oh yeah we had that in psalm four i think the same okay. one when we looked at that yeah I think there's a little bit of uncertainty, really, as to what the significance of the Hebrew of, with stringed instruments might be. There's lots of debate about that sort of term. Right, then it's got the ma a mascal. So that's mm. a description of the piece, and maybe we'll come to that term a bit later. A mascal of David. So there's your author author mm -hmm. authorship. And then finally, the circumstances when the Ziphites went and told Saul, is not David hiding amongst us? Right. Okay. That's quite so, a yeah. uh, extensive title there. That is, that's your, that's your full-blown thing. That is as much All as you features, get yeah. the title of the psalm. That one there. Right, so let's just think about the uh, first of those elements, liturgical application and use. So there it was. That was the bit that we just saw in Psalm 54, to the choir master with stringed instruments. So that, that phrase, to the choir master, or different versions will obviously translate it differently, 
um, to the chief music musician, I think it's sometimes translated. Mm -hmm. That comes really quite commonly. If you remember, there's 150 psalms. You know, one third of the time, roughly, we have a psalm. Mm -hmm. We have that in the head of the mm -hmm. psalm to the choir master, the chief musician. Which, that's telling us something interesting, isn't it? It's telling us that these psalms um, are being given by whoever wrote them to um, a choir. Mm. So it's not just that these are personal prayers that you know slowly over time have been released out into the public and we've got access to somebody's private prayers. Actually, they've been given out, it seems, at an early stage to, to be something that's shared and something that's used in worship. And so one person's um, writing of a psalm doesn't just stay with that one person. It becomes something that is shared for common worship. And that's often why we'll find today that we, we, we sing the psalms. Mm. It's something that we sort of share together and, and um, recognise that we all can join in with the words of the thoughts expressed there. Yeah, we hope to pick up that a bit more in a separate video of how the psalms are used in the scriptures outside of the psalms. So that's really helpful that uh, you point that out there. Being a choir, I imagine, yeah, lots of people all singing at once. Okay. Yeah, so just uh, a point from uh, from the Old Testament, another book of the Old Testament that's talking historically rather than poetically here in these Psalms. So this is from 1 Chronicles 15, verse 16, um, just to show that, that, that point that there was a choir created by David as king, and it's part of the way that he establishes and prepares for the temple that's going to be used for, for worship um, by it's going to be built by Solomon, his son, and used for worship to replace the, the temporary tabernacle structure. So it says, mm -hmm. David also commanded the chiefs of the Levites to appoint their brothers as the singers who should play loudly on musical instruments, on harps and lyres and cymbals, and to raise sounds of joy. Mm -hmm. okay, so, so that's interesting again, isn't it? If, you, if you're giving these psalms over to the choir master, um they're going to be levites from the tribe of levi um and as well as singing there's going to be music accompanying it and it seems like the music's not just a sort of quite in the background thing it's, it's actually quite dramatic and mm. actually part of um the whole experience of um, people worshiping and hearing these these words so yeah, well, I just clarify my last comment. Of course, it choirs lots of people. Uh, <laughs> what I meant by that, I guess, is some of the psalms are pretty personal expressions, but you're getting uh -huh. them sung by lots of people. Like some of the stuff we looked at, you know, breaking the teeth of the enemies and stuff. That's David's personal response, but he's getting the choir to sing that. That's quite a interesting. Yeah, and it might. Be, but it's interesting almost to imagine it, isn't it? It's how how would um, how would they have set these different psalms? Um, and arrange them. Um, so it may be that uh, for some, there was lots of shouting, lots of symbols, lots of noise, lots of joyfulness. As you said, some of the others, maybe they lend themselves more to an individual voice. Mm. Um, some of them may be call and response a little bit. I think you can see that in Psalm 136, is it, mm -hmm. where it keeps repeating a phrase between there's a, there's a, a, a section. A refrain that, or something. Yeah, 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 there's a refrain, that's right. You have a line then a refrain, then a line, then a refrain. And it's almost like there's a single voice and a choir voice, a single voice and a choir voice. So yeah, they can sort of come to life a little bit if you imagine. <laughs> I wonder as well whether with the translation to the English, sometimes some of those musical things get lost a little bit and we read the psalm and can't quite see how we'd sing mm. that. I think that's right. I think there's yeah. a bit, there you go. There's a few obscure things. Uh, so either it's obscure because it's, it's the, the way that the Hebrew is, is perhaps not used elsewhere much in Scripture. So it's difficult to get a sense of what the words actually mean, basically. Mm. Yeah. But then we might know, you know, maybe that we know what the Hebrew words mean, got a pretty good idea of what it means. But why is, it, why is that word or that expression at the, time, at the start of a psalm? How does it fit with the psalm itself? That might be a little bit puzzling, confusing. So... Um, there you go. There's a few examples. What, why? Why, are the, why is the title of four of the psalms "Do Not Destroy"? Mm. Now, is it that it's something to do with the theme of the psalm? It's that, that 
is it something to do with the way that it's the psalm's going to be be a plea to God to preserve the life of the one in the psalm? Is it a tune? You know, was there a famous tune, a well-known tune that was uh, "Do Not Destroy," and that, and that somehow the, the psalm words were weaved around um, a, a famous tune? Mm. There's this one, "Gitteth." Um, now that's pretty well known. I think that that means wine presses. But why wine presses at the mm-hmm. start of these psalms? Well, one idea is that potentially a wine press is a season. When you use a wine press, the season is autumn. Um, mm. And the feast that was the Jewish feast that's prescribed for that period is the Feast of Tabernacles, amongst others. So, so maybe there's a clue in this Gittith, um that was to think that this, uh, those psalms somehow may be linked a little bit to the Feast of Tabernacles. Because there are some psalm titles that refer to when to be to be sung. I know there's some Sabbath ones, isn't mm-hmm. there? Ones yeah, for festivals, right. so that would link in. Yeah. Yeah, and there's another one, just as another example. I'm not going to talk, I'm going to say that. It's going to sound weird when I do Neginoth. Neginoth? Yeah, that's something like that. Uh, which uh, seems to mean something like, you know, hitting, beating, sort of strikings. Um, Maybe the symbols. What's going on in the uh, thoughts, maybe, of the psalm there. Not mm. sure. You know, some of these things aren't really clear in, in the titles of the psalms. Right. What have we got next? All right, so there you go. One of the, the next thing, as well as the liturgical direction of usage of the psalm, how it might be sung, um, there's various different terms used for sort of types of psalm, and what's the difference between a, a psalm and a song? Not sure. Maybe they're quite similar to each other. The, the words there in brackets are just um, a transliteration of the Hebrew, so mizmer, psalm, and shir. Um, a song um, so you can see that there's the numbers there say just how many of the psalms and it's the psalm numbers themselves so you can see 44 of them are actually headed up as a psalm 30 of them as a song and the ones that perhaps are uh, the most interesting because you know they're different <laughs> but there's there's a few of them is these two m ones masculine and miktam um again a bit of a puzzle maybe but masculine Maybe the idea there is to do with instruction, something that's sort of a, a wisdom that's being communicated um, through the psalm itself. Um, whereas a miktam, maybe private prayer and meditation and very personal mm-hmm. thing, and a thing that's been thought about carefully. The idea might be that it's been crafted in for for uh, for use in the way that the person has originally constructed the miktan. I was just thinking as well, Kerry, it's quite interesting because I think in um, Colossians in the New Testament, I don't know whether it's different with the Greek and the Hebrew, but it differentiates between singing psalms and spiritual songs. So it seems to split these two ideas up as well to, to okay. most highlight yeah. the difference. Maybe I'm not sure about that. I just thought it was yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure either. No, I'm not sure. And then maybe by that time in the New Testament times, psalm at that point could have had a, a meaning that now took on the things that are in the book of the Psalms. Mm. Whereas a song at that point might not be like a song in the book of Psalms. It might be a song that's not a Psalm, if you know what I mean. Some other uh, composition. Yeah. 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 Yeah, A later composition. Yeah. Ah, So I was just going to say, let me just go back to that side. So just to, just to say that of the songs of the she is, um, 30 of them, 15 of them all come together um, towards the end of the book of Psalms. You're going to be doing well if you're getting your series up to these ones. Um, Psalms 120 to 134. We'll invite you back then, Kevin. (laughs) And I just got a song, they're called um, Song of Degrees. So that's an interesting title, Song of Degrees. What's what's that about? Mm. Um, So here we go, very quickly. Um, Songs of Degrees. So the word that is being used there in Hebrew is something like ma'ala or something like that. Um, so it comes 47 times in the, in the um, Hebrew scriptures. Tw- uh, 15 of them at the heads of each one of those um, 15 psalms all collected together. Um, 
but then by far, uh, in a way, the biggest sort of set of times that that word comes, degrees comes, 12 times out of 47 is all to do with historically something specific in the Hebrew scriptures. And it's all about um, the time that Hezekiah is surrounded as king of, king of Ju Judah and Jerusalem. He's surrounded um, by the Assyrian army. They're besieging the city and he's in desperate straits, him and his people. Uh, he's a faithful king um, and he is looking to God for deliverance and um, Isaiah the prophet is prophesying at the time and the, Isaiah goes to see Hezekiah. Okay, so I just thought I'd just bring in this historical context of what the Psalms of Degrees, the, the, the clue that there's this word degrees potentially suggests may be of the time of Hezekiah. And this is inter interesting because those 15 Psalms, it's notoriously difficult to pinpoint down what the historical background might be. They, they feel quite general in their themes. Um, there's nothing to say, you know, it's a personal experience uh, mm. at a particular time, really, in, in any of the Psalms. Um, so there, there's a section from Isaiah 38. And I just point out, there you go, there's bits in yellow. We've got the steps, even though what some of them say dial, it's, it's, that, that word degrees, it all seems to be talking about specific set of steps, physical steps, um, mm. in the architecture, uh, maybe of the, the, the temple. Um, and it, there's a sign that um, is going to be given to Hezekiah um, by God to show that God will do what he's promised, to, to, to deliver the city, to, to, to defend, what does it say there? I'm going to deliver you and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria and I will defend the city. This is going to be the sign. Uh, interestingly, it's got it within the sign and within the whole thing, 15 years are going to be added to the life of Hezekiah and the sun is going to miraculously move back 10 steps. You know, if you imagine the shadow moving, it's going to suddenly reverse backwards. Um, 10 steps and that's interesting 15 psalms 15 years and we actually have 10 of those 15 psalms where there's no author given the other five it's either david or solomon mm. so an idea is that maybe these 15 psalms 10 from the time of hezekiah added to five and brought together as a little mini collection within the book of psalms itself um or or form a song cycle that is to do with the deliverance of Judah and Jerusalem and Hezekiah in particular as a king from the Assyrians. And those bits I've just highlighted in yellow, I don't know, yellow, orange, um, all sort of feed into some of the uh, themes that are there within those songs of degrees, mm. some 120 to 134 tears deliverance of the city and defending the city and, and the character of David himself. So, so there's an example where the title of the psalm, just this little phrase, Song of Degrees, it's all a little bit, you know, I'm Cryptic, working yeah. things together and we can't be totally sure about them, but there's a suggestion that might enable us to narrow down perhaps a bit of the context in which those songs were put together as a collection. Mm. the theme that or the preoccupation that's there about the uh, the uh, continuation of prayers and praises in the city of Jerusalem particularly in God's temple mm. 